Hello everyone, I'm Talha, product manager for Big Data. And today I'm going to be telling you about all the amazing things we have done for the cloud. So with that, let's begin. Before we dig deep into everything cloud, let's review today's agenda. We will go over a survey, then we will cover MicroStrategy being cloud agnostic, following into our three pillar strategy. And lastly, we will look at connectivity of each of the three main cloud providers independently. So for all the people who were thinking of ways to answer a survey, sadly, this one was taken beforehand. But let's review the question and the results. The question was, with the speed of technological innovation sure to accelerate in the next decade, this year's survey asked respondents for their thoughts on which tech trend would have the greatest impact on their analytics initiatives. The answer came out and guess which one came first? Cloud. Shouldn't be too hard given it's the first thing on the slide. So over the next five years, cloud computing comes out in the front, rounding up the top five are internet of things, artificial intelligence and machine learning, big data, privacy and security, and last but not least, 5G. And everyone knows that 5G tops the list with the most amount of conspiracy theories. Okay. Now let's take a look at our current cloud infrastructure providers. As always, AWS is leading with a 32% market cap, followed by Azure at 18% market cap, which grew 4% in the past two years. And lastly, Google Cloud. Google Cloud has a growth of almost 50% in the last two years with a total market cap of 9% compared to 6% in 2018. And then we have other providers like Alibaba, Oracle, Salesforce, and many others covering the rest of the 33% market cap. You can constantly see customers switching between different clouds due to different reasons, whether it is a retail customer switching from one cloud to the competing nature of the cloud's business, uh, cost, or they want to partially use a different cloud for the advanced functionality it offers. So with that, it is very clear that the future cloud landscape will be very complex. And you can imagine your deployments as a mixture of different clouds and on-prem systems to optimize your investments. And that's where MicroStrategy comes in with the highest return on investment being cloud agnostic. You can deploy MicroStrategy on AWS and Azure with a few clicks and on other platforms using on-prem style. Today, you are with one provider and you want to move to some other cloud. MicroStrategy got your back with the seamless backup and restore. And of course, with MicroStrategy MCE, you will get dramatically simplified upgrades, sandbox testing, and disaster recovery. Now, let's get to my favorite topic, any form of data. That's right, where MicroStrategy is the leading enterprise one-stop pit shop for connecting to all kinds of data sources. You can connect whether it is SQL, NoSQL, key value pair, or even residing in different data lake storage systems like S3, ADLS2, GCS, with our out-of-the-box cloud storage connectors, which were available in 2021. I like to look at our connectivity from a three-pillar perspective. We have the ODBC and the JDBC pillar, we have the REST SDK pillar and the cloud storage pillar. We have the traditional ODBC and the JDBC pillar to connect to Amazon Redshift, Oracle, Teradata, SQL Server, Cloudera, BigQuery, Snowflake, you name it. And we send individually optimized queries for each warehouse we are connecting to. We have been making a lot of improvements in our authentication initiatives and focusing on customers bringing their own credentials. Now you can use OIDC, seamless SSO experience, and even take advantage of our 2021 OAuth connectivity workflow updates for BigQuery and Snowflake. Then we have the REST SDK pillar where you can use MS Radio packages with Kafka, 
to bring data directly into MicroStrategy. This saves a lot of cost as you don't have to go through the cumbersome process of loading the data into the warehouse and it can help you consume data for real time use cases. Lastly, but not the least, we have the cloud storage pillar. And yes, you heard me right earlier. You don't have to worry about your ETL process to complete before you can tap into the data. In MicroStrategy 2021, you can connect to compressed columnar storage systems, for example, Parquet, Avro, ORC, JSON, right out of the box. And now let's look at an example from each pillar individually. For our first, we have the ODBC and the JDBC pillar. We have an example here of our new seamless OAuth workflow for Snowflake using Okta as the credential provider. Now let's take a look at how easy it is to set up and use. So with that, creating new data, we will choose Snowflake as the warehouse. Okay, here we're gonna create a data source and we will put the OAuth connection information. So we will put the server name, warehouse, database, schema, and then of course the data source name. So here we have an option to choose between Azure AD or Okta as a credential provider. So we will choose Okta in this case. And then we provide client ID, client secret, OAuth URL, uh, token URL, and callback URL. So uh, with that, like, uh, uh, we can begin and press OK. So then we click on the data source. So this is the OAuth workflow. So if you are not familiar with it, it is very close to how you use Facebook or Google Cloud or Google Authentication to log in into those third-party apps or video games. So here we click on it. Now we can type the namespace and get the data sets. So let's select something. Uh, we can drag multiple tables and we have an option between connect live or in memory data set. So let's use connect live for ad hoc analysis. And now this is basically it. You can drag and uh, drop attributes, metrics, so we can see country, brand, and the call center information. So I know this, this is a very quick uh, demo, but it took me less than two minutes to do it. Uh, I'm sure the hardest part with this is to get all the credentials, but I'm sure if an admin is doing it 24 hours a day, he can possibly beat me in under two minutes also. With that, let's take a look at the next uh, pillar. So the next pillar we have is the REST SDK pillar. <clears throat> so as we all know, Kafka is being used everywhere these days for data streaming, monitoring, or logging events in the biggest financial, telecom, social industries. And with our REST SDK, you can simplify data processing. That means faster time to value, build real-time dossiers, or even blend data between Kafka and other data sources, like a traditional database. With that, let's look at the demo. So here we have Google Finance. So if you think that Google Finance doesn't solve your business use case, you can actually uh, pull all the data from Google Finance. So here we will start Zookeeper and Kafka. Zookeeper is the broker, while Kafka is the streaming service. So we are just starting it up. Now we are gonna tell Google Finance using the Google API to send the data back into a Kafka topic. So here we are just telling it, okay, start sending data into a Kafka topic. And then we're gonna uh, start uh, turning on our consumer and tell our MSTR package to uh, MS Stereo package to send data uh, to the cube with the push API. And then with this simple modification, you can go ahead and start pushing data into MicroStrategy. And here we, now we can select the cube So now this dossier uh, is based on a cube, which is refreshed every five seconds. So it's actually almost real time uh, data that you can see. And you do have an option to change the dossier refresh rate to two seconds also. 
and you can just play around with the data for Google Finance and be up to date uh, in real time, almost real time. So definitely a very important pillar. Uh, let's go to the next one. <laughs> so the next pillar we have is cloud storage. So with cloud storage, um, this is actually a new functionality only in 2021, where we built our own in-house Spark-based uh, connector. And it's actually very performant and we are fully committed to modifying it, uh, enhancing it. So any feedback you guys have, let us know. And we built it right out of the box uh, ourselves in 2021. So let's look at the demo. So here we have the workstation. We'll open the data source, select Google Cloud Storage. So we will click on the data source, name something. Then we have the project ID, client ID, client email, private key ID, and private key. Uh, almost makes me feel like one of those auction guys. Uh, then we press OK. So all of this information you can get from Google Cloud Console. So here we will search for the bucket. So in this case, we're going to search for MCI bucket. And then the good thing is, like a, with these cloud storage connectors, you can drag parquet fi uh, files as well as parquet partition folders. So here we drag the whole folder. It's actually uh, a lot of data. So we drag uh, a folder in a JSON file. So we do support other languages. Just wanted to highlight that. Uh, so, and then let's try to save the cube. I should also tell you that uh, the yellow cap trip data was a couple of GBs of data. So I had to fast forward a little bit so you can see it's going in Jedi speed. Uh, okay, it's about to be done soon. So, and then here we imported the data. So now let's go ahead, create a dossier based on it. Well, so we have an existing data set. It will ask us to save the dossier first. So let's go ahead and quickly save it. Now we can bring into the uh, bring in the cube, and then uh, we can see like what's the total distance, or if we want to see like uh, what's the distance by by like the passenger, the number of passengers riding the yellow cab, we can also see that. I mean, it's one of the ad hoc analysis. I'm sure like you can do a lot better than this. <laughs> So this is our cloud storage pillar. Again, um, it is something that we built uh, just in 2021 and it's Spark based and we are fully committed to supporting it. So feedback is always welcome for it. Okay, then let's go next and let's look at uh, each uh, main clouds one by one. So as we all know, organizations are picking one cloud provider and using them for services. So in this case, we have AWS. So we have the ODBC and the GDBC pillar where we can connect to SQL sources or Live Connect. So we have Amazon Redshift. So Amazon Redshift is our diamond gateway. So we offer the best connectivity out there. Then we have Amazon RDS. So Amazon RDS is a combination of a lot of uh, relational databases, MySQL, Postgres, and whatnot. Then we have Amazon EMR. So you can connect to Amazon EMR using our Hive connector. Then after that, we have Snowflake. So Snowflake is something actually uh, very important these days. It has been coming up a lot. A lot of people are shifting to Snowflake due to uh, the separation of cost and compute, and actually much easier to use overall. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of people uh, used our ODBC and JDBC connectivity for it. We also have the OAuth workflow with it, with Okta and Azure, as we saw in the demo before. So definitely, we are committed to supporting Snowflake very well. Then we have Databricks. So for Databricks, you can use Spark SQL to connect to it. Then we have Amazon Document DB, which is an equivalent of MongoDB. And then we have Apache Spark. Uh, of course, we support it. We have Cloudera Impala. We have Cloudera Hive. And then we have Cloudera Hortonworks. I think Hortonworks is supposed to 
end of life is like 2021 but we are committed to supporting it for its end of till its end of, till its end of life then the next one we have is the rest sdk pillar again we already demoed it uh, is using kafka and you can bring data into real time use cases and then the last pillar we have is the cloud storage connector so as always it was built in house very good for bulk imports and tapping direct uh, tapping directly into the data using uh, MicroStrategy and it could be Parquet, Avro, or ORC, or even we are planning on supporting the Delta Lake format. So Delta Lake format is something that you're going to be seeing in the upcoming updates. Uh, Delta Lake has a lot of advantages when it comes to data reliability and management of the data lifecycle. And then we also connect to Box. Let's look at Azure now. So with Azure, we have the ODBC and the JDBC pillar. Um, so again, we have the uh, Microsoft SQL Server, which is a diamond gateway. So um, we are fully committing to supporting it. Then we have Cosmos DB. We have Azure Synapse. Then uh, Snowflake again. So we do support Snowflake on Azure too. Then we have Databricks. Then we have HD Insight. So HD Insight is similar to Amazon EMR. So you can connect using Hive, uh, our Hive driver. Then we have Apache Spark, Cloudera, Hive, and Cloudera Hortonworks. Then we have the second pillar, the REST SDK, which is we already covered last slide also. And then the last pillar we have is the Cloud Storage Connector. As always, we can do bulk imports. And in Azure, we can connect to ADLS Gen 2. So we can actually tap into directly into the data before the ETL, everything is processed. We can just start learning about what's in the data. And then a few other things uh, that is special to Azure is OneDrive and SharePoint. So we do have connectors for that also. <clears throat> now let's look at GCS, Google Cloud's platform. So basically, uh, this is definitely one of the most upcoming cloud platforms. Um, for the ODBC and the GDBC pillar, we have Google BigQuery. So this is probably, I think the top thing people go for Google Cloud, like BigQuery, like very fast compute. Uh, we, we have three ways of connecting to BigQuery. We have the ODBC driver, the GDBC driver, and our native driver to connect to BigQuery. And we also uh, support OAuth workflow with BigQuery also. So you can just use your Google uh, account to basically log into BigQuery and start using the data. So you don't have to set up the whole uh, getting the service key and whatnot to go. With. So you can directly just use your account credentials. Then we have uh, Cloud Spanner. So Cloud Spanner is actually very interesting. Like. Uh, it is so I'm sure everyone knows about the cap theorem if you don't like it says that so cap theorem is like if you have consistent available and reliability as, uh, as a three pillars so at if you want your uh, database to work like two of them needs to work and the third one you have to compromise but with cloud spanner somehow Google managed to get all three of them right so I know like at one point if there's some uh, some competition then they will say okay data should be consistent before available but cloud spanner is definitely one of the upcoming things uh, uh, as uh, one one downside to that is it's very expensive and i say it because we test like so much data so it has been costing us a lot too <laughs> um, then then we have the cloud sql so again very similar to the other cloud providers you have mysql postgres microsoft sql server so you can connect to all of them then you have the uh, google cloud data proc which is very close to aws uh, emr and uh, basically we connect to emr using hive so similar to that then we have apache spark and then hive then the second pillar stays constant uh, same pull and push and then the last one we have is the cloud storage connector. So as you already saw the demo on the cloud storage connector, we can connect very easily. And then we have Google Drive. So with that, we covered all the three main, uh, uh, the three main clouds. 
Now we're going to pass it over to Nick to tell us about some of the customer stories that we have. So Nick, do you mind telling us about Sainsbury, uh, one of the customers who were moving to Snowflake? Yes, of course. So um, Sainsbury is uh, in many ways a legacy MicroStrategy customer. They've been a customer for 19, 20 years. They, uh, they were loyal to, to MicroStrategy and to Teradata. And then they made a strategic move to unify all of their data in one place. So the, from, from a, a CEO level, uh, this was called Project Aspire. And the, the, the mission statement was to know more about their customers than anybody else. So single version of the truth was one of the guiding principles of Project Aspire from the start. Um, Sainsbury's took the decision to uh, stick with MicroStrategy because we were able to uh, demonstrate that MCE was an enterprise and that MicroStrategy uh, adapted to the constraints of cloud or the, uh, the opportunities within cloud uh, much better than any other BI product. But they changed their mind about the data warehouse and they switched to Snowflake. Uh, and that required um, a little bit of proof of concept work from us to demonstrate that we could, dem we could generate optimized SQL against mm -hmm. Snowflake. And really, before I, I let you carry on, um, I think one of the most interesting things about the way Sainsbury's have adopted MicroStrategy and Snowflake in the cloud is that it's very much work in progress. If you're in the BI business, you're used to hearing prospective customers telling you that they need to get their data sorted out before they get their business intelligence sorted out. And that always seems to me to have it backwards because unless you put something in front of a business user, it's very difficult to understand what they need. Um, the refreshing approach of Sainsbury's was to say, we're gonna replace our data warehouse. So we're actually gonna drop the Teradata boxes and the schemas and all of that and replace it with the new data warehouse. But if it isn't finished, we don't mind. We're gonna keep on going. And so they have um, a data warehouse and also a series of MicroStrategy applications which are very much in a state of flux. They're very much strategic. They support more than 14,000 users, including mobile applications in the stores for the first time. But at the same time, they're very much unfinished. There is definitely you know, deep holes being dug in that data warehouse, absolutely right. Uh, and so that, that approach, I think that speaks well to the flexibility of MicroStrategy and Snowflake, our partners, but also to the flexibility that you get out of cloud. Upgrades are very much quicker and easier. The ability to spin up new boxes, to move to different versions, all of that has been made much more straightforward as far as Sainsbury's are concerned. And that means they can be more agile with their data and their application. So thank you, Nick, for all the detail. Like I was gonna ask you uh, the, the, some questions, but looks like you answered everything before I could even ask. So with that, uh, let's invite HF to come and talk about the experience of a retail customer using our Cloud Storage Connected. So HF, can you please shed some light on us? Yes, hello Tara, hello everyone. We've been lucky enough to work with a, an early version of this Cloud Connector. Uh, it was only back in the day, September, October, with a customer that had a very interesting challenge. The, as they moved from, exa, uh, from Exadata to the cloud-based uh, data warehousing and and Data Lake, they've been starting to adopt Azure as a primary data store, Azure Data Lake. And as soon as they started having real-time data in there, their users were so excited, they started with Power BI to connect to this Data Lake, Azure Data Lake, and start building dashboards. And after a few weeks, they realized that um, the solution couldn't scale. They could load up to two or three months of data in there, but the volume was so high that the dashboards became, became really slow and they had needs to analyze year over year across the entire rolling 12 months, which needs at least to load two years of data, right? So they asked us if we could help uh, address these challenges with a new cloud connector. And, uh, and actually we did, it was a pretty cool use case. So HF, like that's wonderful. Do you wanna talk about some performance? Like I know they were using some other tool before like Power BI and maybe tell us a little bit about it. Yes. Um, it's, a, it's quite a funny story, actually. 
at first, the customer challenged us to load three months of data like they had in, uh, in Power BI. And so they, they sent us a, a big zip file with 16 gig of parquet data, which uh, we loaded into our server. Uh, takes a bit about like one hour, one hour and a half to load. We had 1 billion rows in there. And then when we started building a dossier, uh, we were happy, not surprised, but happy to see it was responding in one second for every click. But the, the fun part of the story is this is when we realized they gave us three years of data instead of three months. And when we present the, presented the result back to them, initially they didn't believe it, but we looked at it again, 16 gig of parquet, parquet data, takes about 80 gig in memory with the MicroStrategy cube. And uh, we had 1 billion rows that with a dossier that was super fast and uh, there was, they were quite happy with the result here. Um, oh, that's wonderful, HF. Uh, I know you already discussed like how their data was structured. Can you tell a little bit about like how were they able to use MicroStrategy's file structure format to drag and drop data into folders and maybe discuss a little bit about that? Yes, this is something uh, that was also interesting for them. Um, like most data lakes, the data flows in in, uh, in predefined folder structures where you use kind of partitioning technologies uh, on the Azure data lakes, uh, which is every new year you have a folder named year equals 2020. Then in there you have one folder per month, months equals 01, months equals 02. And it, it goes on, could be days, hours, minutes, and so on, right? And every time there is a new data stream coming up, creates a new file in the right folder uh, structure. So they, what they want is for us to directly connect to this structure. So you don't need to transform anything in the data lake. Data flows in the data lake with a given structure. We just read that structure. That was the need. And so what was really cool about this use case is we, we took this folder structure. Uh, we just had to drag and drop um, year equal 2020 folder. The name, that's the name of the folder. And then in MicroStrategy, as we import the data into a cube, it will automatically create a, an attribute name year with value 2020, and then it creates the month attribute and the day attribute, and it reads the folder structure, gives me all the values, and I can, with one click, just filter on this time hierarchy that's driven by the file folder structure. And if you if you drag and drop the entire folder with all the years, it will create a year attribute with all the year values, all the months, all the days, and so on. It's, it's very flexible for the users and very, very convenient. Thank you very much, HF, like this was wonderful. Um, I just wanted to highlight like this customer was actually partnering with us before the release and they were working with us to build this product. So it's one of the things <clears throat> I put out there, like uh, definitely we want to partner with other firms. And if you want to help us build the product, we are all in helping you as well as helping everyone out there. With that, and thank you very much.